spontaneous regression, which to me, it's not the right terminology because, in fact, what we're saying is sometimes cancer goes away, and instead of finding out what makes it go away, we're just going to say it's spontaneous, when in fact there has to be a cause. And in my investigations of spontaneous regression, I came across the work of William Coley and of Polly Matzinger, who, who talked about these new ideas in immunology that explain why Dr. Coley's therapy worked. And this has not been understood for many years. And then finally, in, in about 10 years ago, we began to understand why this works and place it on a proper footing. For our listeners who perhaps are not familiar with Coley's toxin or Coley's fluid or Coley's vaccine, explain, if you would briefly, who was Dr. William Coley and what he did and why you think it's so important and relevant to today's cancer research. Sure. Uh, Dr. Coley was a graduate from Harvard in 1888, and beginning in about 1890-91, he was working at the predecessor of Memorial Sloan Kettering Hospital in New York. And his very first cancer patient was a young woman by the name of Bessie Dashiell, who was the girlfriend of John D. Rockefeller Jr. Now, Rockefeller was a teenager at this time, but, you know, they were basically boyfriend and girlfriend. And Bessie had a sarcoma on her wrist. And Coley did everything that was proper to treat this sarcoma. He amputated the arm. And yet the cancer came back, and Bessie died a horrible death. And this shocked Coley. Young physician, first cancer patient, dies a horrible death. And he set about to research every sarcoma patient that he could find that had been through the New York hospital system to find out what happened to them. And what he found is they pretty much all died, all of them that he could uh, trace, except for one. There was a patient who was treated seven years previously, and um, what happened to this patient is uh, he apparently had a spontaneous regression. So Coley, using his scientific German, uh, went through the tenements on the Lower East Side of Manhattan from rooming house to rooming house and found this German immigrant whose name was uh, Stein. Stein was in perfect health. He took him back to Memorial Hospital and had Dr. Bull, who was the, uh, the surgeon who did the operation seven years previously, have a look at him, and they confirmed that the uh, sarcoma was gone. And when the sarcoma regressed, back when he was in the hospital, he had had a concurrent infection. That means he had the cancer and an infection at the same time. And the infection was something that they called erysipelas. Erysipelas is an infection caused by a bacteria called uh, Streptococcus pyogenes today. So what Coley decided was if an accidental infection could lead to the regression of cancer, then so too could an intentional infection. And so he decided to treat the next sarcoma patient that came into the hospital system and was willing to do it uh, the same way, by infecting him with the erysipelas germ and seeing if this led to the uh, regression of the cancer. This story has been documented many times, but what happened is it worked. The patient got better, and then Coley continued to use uh, live bacteria to uh, infect cancer patients to see if the cancer would regress, and he had some setbacks. He had several patients who died of septicemia because he was infecting them with a live bacteria. So he decided more out of uh, intuition than any solid scientific basis, he decided that if a dead bacteria could, uh, sorry, a live bacteria could cause this regression to occur, then perhaps so could a dead bacteria. He had this mixture made up of two types of bacteria, one a gram negative and one a gram positive, which are the two major classes of bacteria. And uh, the first patient he treated with this completely recovered and uh, lived for 27 years. That's called a durable complete response until he died of a uh, heart attack. And so in the ensuing years, this particular therapy 
became a standard in the treatment of bone cancer, mainly because Coley was a specialist in bone cancer. But it was also used to treat a wide variety of other cancers successfully, including uh, ovarian, cervical, breast cancer, multiple myelomas, kidney cancer, melanoma, all types of other cancers. And many, many researchers have looked at this historical data and have come to the conclusion that, in fact, these results were better than would be expected for similar patients treated today with modern therapies. But we really didn't understand what was going on. And after Polly came out with her danger model, which was uh, so successful in explaining how this particular therapy works, we're beginning to understand exactly how it is that the therapy works. So the latest paper that I have here in front of me, I think from September of last year, by Decker and Safdar from MD Anderson Cancer Center, a major cancer center in Texas, uh, they state categorically that Dr. Coley achieved long-term cure rates, cure rates, unrivaled by medical science in the 73 years since his death. You are listening to Don McAdam. He's CEO of MBVAX Bioscience, a company in Canada that has reintroduced Coley's historic cancer treatment. Don McAdams, how did Dr. William Coley administer his toxin? What was his protocol? And again, I'd like to know how well it worked. You know, of the thousand or so patients that he treated, what was his overall success rate? Coley would inject the vaccine either intramuscularly or intravenously or directly into a tumor. And he would in, inject it beginning with a very low dose, very low dose. And he would gradually increase that dose. It's called a titrated dose until he induced a high fever. He was looking for a fever of 104 to 106 degrees. And then once he achieved that high fever, he would hold that dosage until it no longer produced a high fever. And then he would increase it again. How often did he administer it? That's the key. As Polly Massinger once wrote, if you're going to immunize, you have to do it frequently, three to five treatments per week. We recommend five, but some patients are too weak for five. So three to five treatments per week. And if you can get that five treatments a week, and if you can get that induction of a high fever, uh, in every recent case, every case, we see this immune response this immune response that, that leads in most cases to documented regression of the tumors. And how long does the treatment proceed? It's different for different patients, but we recently had a patient with um, stage 4 lung cancer with metastases to um, both kidneys and to the liver. This is a terminal condition, as anyone probably knows. This patient received five sessions a week for six weeks, and at the end of six weeks, there was no detectable cancer by CT scan or X-ray. Now, that's the most remarkable case that I've seen, both because it's lung cancer, which is so difficult, but also because of the rapidity. We've had other patients who have been on the vaccine for up to a year before they achieved a complete remission. That is no remaining sign of disease. We need to let people know that this therapy is not widely available. Is that correct? Yes, I think so. This therapy is not available. It's not approved in the United States. It's not approved in Canada. It's available on a compassionate use basis only, and then only in certain countries. We have 700,000 people in Canada and the United States each year dying of cancer. And to my way of thinking, that means 700,000 people a year no longer respond to existing therapies. I mean, if they did, they wouldn't die. Therefore, we have 700,000 people a year who really can't, don't respond to any medication. Those people, of the ones that, that we've seen, more than 90% respond to fluid in some manner, at least in terms of subjective improvements, that is, uh, reduction in pain, improvement of mobility, improvement in appetite. We see roughly 20, 22% over all the patients we've treated will have um, those subjective improvements. And 
92% of all the patients that have received this therapy have confirmed tumor re regression. And so far, we've seen in 19% of the patients complete remissions, no remaining sign of cancer. What are the uh, side effects? I would have to say very few. What is the risk compared to other alternatives? Very small. I can imagine a patient listening to this conversation who might have cancer, might even have metastatic cancer, or be given a very grim prognosis saying, well, I can't afford to wait a year or five years for all of the science and the research that you're talking about to you know, prove or disprove this approach. I'd like to try it now. I have nothing to lose. I've been through everything that there is. I've had all the chemotherapy that's available. I perhaps have had the radiation therapy. I've had the surgery. And I'm told I've got six months to live. So I would like to try this stuff. I could live with the fever. I could live with the anemia. I can't live with my cancer. It's going to kill me. Where can I go to find it? This is one of the reasons why we've delayed publicly disclosing the results that we've achieved so far in the Compassionate Use Program. We really don't have a good answer to that question. I think that um, any government in the world, the health regulators in any country in the world, should allow uh, terminal cancer patients a great deal of leeway in terms of therapies that they can have. So, you know, for example, we have, um, on a compassionate use basis, we've treated patients or patients in just about every, many countries in Europe and in Asia and in uh, Australia and New Zealand and uh, South America have routinely received therapy uh, from their local physician based on compassionate use. And yet in the United States, well, in Canada is a good example, two applications have been made to Health Canada for compassionate use, and they've both been rejected. So we, there is no way for a Canadian, and I'm a Canadian, my company is here in Canada, to receive this therapy. There's nothing I can do about it. Um, the only way that it can be made available is if the Canadian government changed their position or special access program, allowed special access. But so far they haven't. And I'm hoping that if we can get some uh, public support and, and, and additional researchers and different people come out and um, you know, try to get this available, that, uh, that it will be available. And there's no reason why it shouldn't be available. It's very inexpensive to make. It's, um, it's a tragedy that, that here is something and other things and other cancer medications that could possibly be used and possibly benefit people. And uh, even when someone has been told there's nothing more that can be done for you, they're not at the same time advised, well, with this, we're, not, we're telling you there's nothing we can, we can do for you that's been approved, but because we're at that point, you are now able to use things that aren't approved, providing uh, they're reasonable, and you have a U.S. licensed physician that wants to do it, and, and you want to do it, and there's no commercial interest. Why should anyone interfere with that? It's unconscionable.